A rook perched on the headstone. Charlie stared it down, but the bird appeared unruffled by his presence. It was one of the old headstones, a worn Celtic cross, turn of the century. Today, the trend was shiny black plaques on pedestals. The adjacent grave had them, heart-shaped black slabs with the legend brother or father or Joe written in shiny gold letters. He found it revoltingly slick. One had the shape of a mobile phone with the deceased number indelible in gold, as if it were possible to make a call to the afterlife, if only you knew the prefix to dial. Charlie removed the desiccated blooms from the vase and opened the crinkly plastic around the daffodils. How Clara had loved the golden sign of spring, cooing with excitement with the first yellow trumpets. He arranged the stems in the thick green glass, trying to keep them from listing to one side. But despite his best efforts, the vase looked lopsided. A loud laugh made him look up. Just the rook. Its bright eyes regarded him with what appeared to be humor, though Charlie thought it was foolish to assume any such emotion on the putt of the bird. Smart birds, sure. But people tended to anthropomorphize them far too much. It was just their nature to sound like chuckling pirates. He kneeled down and laid a hand on Clara's headstone. The pink granite chilled his palm. A year to the day, he said, the words barely audible. Here I am, and here you are, and it's not any easier, little sis. The finality of the etched letters, even more so, the carved numbers, bludgeoned him with the truth. While we remember, his mother had said, holding her locket to her breast, her father's fading portrait moldering inside, they live on. Charlie had bit his tongue to stop himself saying, not much of a life, that. With closed eyes, he pictured his sister's smile, the way she brushed that lock of hair from her face that always fell across her brow. He heard her laugh, too. It echoed loudly, and his eyes snapped open. The rook had flown over to Clara's headstone and perched not a foot from Charlie's head. It leaned forward to croak at him, its broad beak open as it squawked. An irrational anger filled him, as if the bird were somehow desecrating her grave. Shove off, he shouted, waving his arm. The blackbird flapped its wings and hopped as far away as it could. It remained on the top of the granite. It tilted its head and regarded him, seemingly without fear. He found it unsettling. The chill in his hand seeped into his flesh, and he stood up awkwardly, his legs stiff. The rook made a few clicking sounds. Charlie turned and walked away, unable to shake the discomfort the bird provoked. Out of the gates of Bormor, and turning his steps towards the center, Charlie kept hearing the rook's voice. Don't be ridiculous, he scolded himself. He reached Air Square and found it chock full of students and tourists as usual. He hadn't noticed how many rooks there were, too, fighting for scraps with the gulls. Their mutual cacophony drowned out the people's chatter. I should go to work, Charlie thought, but found his steps taking him to the long walk. He found something calming in that spot where the wild waters of the Carib poured into the bay. Nimmo's Pier on the other side of the channel hummed with joggers, dog walkers, and visitors. But once you got past the museum, the side stayed fairly empty. He sat down on the set of steps leading down to the water. The waves lapped the bricks. Distant muted, Distance muted the sounds of the feeding frenzy on the opposite bank. An elderly woman fed the swans and gulls with some bread from a carrier bag. People snapped photos. A rough croak broke his reverie. A rook perched on the lamp attached to the blue wall of the houses. Charlie started, then told himself, it's not the same one. He turned his gaze back to the water, but the bird persisted. He looked again. The bird hopped over to the steel railing and regarded Charlie with its shiny eyes. A graveyard chill rippled through him again. The rook sidled closer, making a variety of clicks and vaguely human-sounding noises. Charlie assumed they only made that caw sound, but supposed they must be capable of making sounds like these. He 
as long as it didn't get too weird. You're not going to say never more, are you? Charlie said aloud, then immediately wished he hadn't. The rook opened its beak as if to answer, but made no sound as it opened and closed it, making clicks. He'd never seen one so close. The beak offered an impressive shape. The shaggy legs fluttered in the wind, and its broad wings flapped as if it were considering what to do next. Charlie reached out a tentative hand. He couldn't have said why, precisely. To show he meant no harm, perhaps, or to suggest he had no fear. The rook ruffled its feathers, hovered for a moment in the air, then approached his outstretched hand. Charlie had a moment to panic that the bird might attack him when it opened its beak and dropped something into his palm. Charlie stared. It was a gold clatter ring with a rough dent in its side that came from wearing it while playing field hockey, which she wasn't supposed to do. You'll bend it all out of shape, the mother had warned. Charlie rolled the ring around. The morgue had lost it. He assumed someone had pocketed it. He looked up at the rook. It leaned forward, croaking again loudly, eyes fixed upon him. Then with a kind of laugh, it flew off. Charlie stared at its shrinking form. I'm not going to work today, he decided. <laughs>